Lateras des Audiens de Claire de Lune, an evocative <clears throat> title translated loosely as the terrace for moonlit audiences or views or the play of light on the terrace late at night. You know, it's kind of an impressionist evocation, but it's kind of funny. It was actually inspired by a 1912, December 1912. This is one of the very last of the preludes from book two. Uh, article in Le Temple of the coronation of King George V as the Emperor of India. So I've talked about different kinds of pieces that Debussy did. You know, he, he deals with um, the poetry of the symbolist, you know, of Verlaine and others. He'll have allusions to English fairy tales. Uh, he'll have imaginative pieces like this one. You know, sometimes the imagination came from going to the 1889 and 1900 expositions in Paris and seeing the gamelan and seeing the, the Russian exhibits and hearing the Russian music and seeing Chinese and Japanese art in the galleries and going into these shops and spending all his money on objet d'art, you know, his Japanese lacquer print or his little frog or his you know, bric-a-brac that was Japanese or Asian. But this, this is the other side of it. I've talked more about the poetic side. This is more, he read this article and he had a vision. And we have to realize that Debussy was coming out of a very complicated musical climate. You know, we had Wagner. Wagner had left his mark on everybody. You know, what do you do after this hyper, hyper chromaticism that Wagner did, particularly in Tristan, with the Tristan and Tisolde with the Tristan chord? You know, this idea of all these applied um, dominants and sevenths, and as I've mentioned before, these third related keys, meaning keys a third apart, you know, what would you do? You know, Brahms in his own way had taken the tonal system to its logical extreme. You know, but he didn't destroy it. Uh, if you watched my film a couple weeks ago, you know, I had people like Stuart Gordon and Elliot Anacolitz, my thesis advisor, talking about how Wagner had destroyed tonality, you know, that he broke it apart with all this chromaticism. And indeed, a lot of people felt this way. Schoenberg picked up this chromaticism and developed the 12 tone system. And Weber, of course, followed that as well in his piano variations. You know, and some, there were some advocates, Schrecker and a few others, of the 12-tone system, but it pretty much petered out because, you know, it was the idea that you'd have a tone row and then you'd state it and then you could have them at different times, but then you'd have, you know, retrograde, you'd have a, maybe an inversion, you'd have these different manipulations, and sure, you know, Schoenberg justified it by, you know, using a suite, a Baroque suite as a form for it, for instance, or a traditional ABA form where you have an idea, a second theme idea, and then the original idea comes back. So Debussy, being the musician Francaise, he would sign this very proudly at the end of his scores because he felt how he was carrying on the tradition from Rameau and Chopin. You know, and indeed, Chopin did his 24 preludes. Well, Debussy did his 24 preludes, sort of a homage to Chopin. So. It's very, this is very important. Again, this, I think there's some accounts that this was actually the very last of the preludes written, though it doesn't appear that way in the book. I've performed both books several times and I find it fascinating to play them as a set because I think he's organized them in a way that there's certain key and octave and mood and thematic things which really relate as a cycle. Many of the writers poo-pooed it. Oh, well, these are just supposed to be preludes to something else. Well, preludes to what? <laughs> you know, preludes to themselves, but you're not going to play a Debussy prelude and then go off and do, you know, a, a sonata or something, you know. So, certainly, for many years, I've, you know, picked and choose among them, you know, and put them together in various interesting ways. But uh, La Terrasse is an especially evocative one, I think. And it's one of the ones I did my thesis on with Eliot and Akolitz. So it got very, very abstract. I will spare you, but to give you a taste from my thesis, the form of La Terrasse is difficult to discern. Surface features commonly associated with tonal forms initially belie the complex underlying pitch transformations. The pervasive F-sharp major key signature, 
as well as tonic dominant pedal relations implied in both F sharp major and C major, the tritone apart, which is a symmetrical construction, so we can supplant tonality because you have an axis. Anyway, this is all the Anacolit stuff that he talked about. Could suggest that tonal relations and functional harmonic progressions are the governing principles. This has often led theorists to confine their analyses of Debussy's works to the semi-functional tonal implications of chords and baseline progressions. You know, they write off, they say, well, this is sort of this key and this is sort of that key. And you know, it's fine as far as it goes, but it only explains it in part. Now, maybe perhaps my analysis only explains it in part too. But the whole thing is that it's all about using the chromatic. The chromatic scale is like a commonality, you know, uh, it washes it all out and from that you can extract anything. You can extract a whole tone, you can extract a diatonic C major scale, or you can have an octatonic scale which is an alternating whole step and half step scale. Very spooky, isn't it? Very evocative. Eastern Europeans use this a lot, the Russians use this a lot, Scriabin used this a lot. Um, so, I'll, I'll bear with me a little bit. The subtle evocative form of La Terrasse does not follow the formal and functional precepts of the tonal system. The partitioning of abstract pitch collections, particularly octatonic set segments, instead creates the illusion of traditional tonal forms. Moreover, the octatonic sets themselves are created by the convergence of whole tone elements, diminished seventh chords, and tritone dyads. La Terrasse is far removed from the process and products of traditional tonal progression. It instead combines elements of a language derived from the 12 equal tones, although this isn't 12 tone music. So this is a whole other kind of piece by Debussy. You know, we start at the very beginning. It's a diminished seventh chord. Then it becomes major seventh chord, meaning a minor triad with a major seventh. So we have diminished, fully diminished. Well, that's a dominant seventh. Though in an inversion, in a context where it certainly doesn't sound or act like one, right? And then he goes to actually, of all things, a G dominant seventh chord which is of all things the dominant is diatonic C major. With Debussy, there's always this big thing about white key versus black key. You know, in La Tra uh, Fireworks we had it. We had this was the white key, this was the black key. Well, so chromatic, he leads us to this G dominant seventh, the most basic in a, in a sense of, of harmonic things. So he really is turning you know, tonality, chromaticism, Wagnerianism, Schoenberg's 12-tone system, he's really playing with it in this piece. And so that's one reason it creates this very modern abstract landscape that, you know, on first hearing may seem pretty difficult, but it's worth, it's worth exploring. This is a piece that I've loved performing for a long time, and it's always special. So I could go on and tell you about all the sevenths and tritones and things, but I think that's enough. You listen for yourself. La Terrasse, his audience, Declare de Lune, one of the very last Debussy preludes from December 1912.